Imagine you're a lawyer. It's a good, stable, well-paid job, but you're not really passionate about it. What you are passionate about is Pokemon cards. Oh my God! But how in the world could you ever make Pokemon cards your full-time job? Creators, I'm Matt Koval, and a while back on Twitter, I asked you who I should interview here on the Creator Insider channel. The creator and channel that got the most votes was Lee from Leonhart. Light Sunflora, Swinub, and the rare. Is it done it, Jonathan? We have done it! We hit. Now by the numbers at the time of this recording, Leonhart has made 1,840 videos since 2014. He has 1,370,000 subscribers. Looks to me like he gets around 160,000 views per video and he uploads four times a week. In my conversation with Lee, I'm gonna ask him how to take the scary leap from part-time creating to full-time creating with your channel, how to change up the type of videos you make, who should be your first hire if you wanna expand your operation, and more. So grab yourself a tasty beverage and let's hear the story of Lee and Hart. Lee, the leap from part-time creator to full-time can be a scary one. I assume you ran your channel for a while before you quit your job as a lawyer. How did that transition happen? So it was a long time coming actually where I was analyzing the uh, risk and is this a good idea? Which analyzing means running it by my wife and my family and essentially uh, started my channel in November of 2014 and basically was building it up the entire time while I was an attorney. And uh, September of, I think it was 2017 is when I made that big leap of quitting my full-time job and doing YouTube full-time, content creation full-time. What was the exact moment you realized you could go full-time? Was it obvious to, to you? Was it a certain amount of views or revenue? Was it a, a, a no-brainer or was it kind of a scary leap? Uh, it was definitely more of a, a safe risk, I would think, at that point because I was waiting to where, um, most importantly, revenue was either saved up or at least was projected to, you know, keep on making a comfortable amount where I could, you know, be supported by revenue on YouTube. And so I had waited, I think it was like at least a year um, of, you know, making a certain amount before I was like, okay, this is how it's projected going to be based off of my analytics that I've been doing and my calculations. And from then on, that's when I kind of made that more calculated, safer risk. It was a risk, but it was a more safer risk of going from you know full-time doing content creation. I guess it's less scary that way. So you were making gaming videos and vlogs and kind of, from what I could tell, a variety of stuff. And then you realize there might be an opportunity to really lean into Pokemon. We get asked a lot how to, how to pivot your content. So what's your advice there? So as far as uh, switching my gears from doing uh, retro nostalgic top 10 lists for video games and such, uh, basically started with finding my old Pokemon card collection. I did a video on that. I found it one, I was very passionate about that and that came off in the type of videos that I was doing in the audience, the viewers on YouTube really enjoyed uh, the passion that was coming through, but they also enjoyed the content as well. So from that older card collection, I dabbed into newer Pokemon cards as well. And from then on, found that it was actually easier to grow and I enjoyed it more as well when doing Pokemon card videos to where naturally, and it wasn't just an overnight type of thing, I gradually uh, got my audience accustomed to more Pokemon videos than those type of retro nostalgic video game videos slash let's plays that I was doing when I first started my channel. And I think that sort of gradual introduction to those types of videos was ultimately why I've been successful in transitioning my channel into an old type of Pokemon niche channel. I wanted to ask you about your current format. Opening cards in your home in one location is a dream. I mean, it strikes me as very sustainable. And I, full disclosure, I don't know much about Pokemon cards, but my assumption is they keep generating new cards. So is there, is there a never ending flow of content for you? 
So why I enjoy my type of content that I do do is it's not just the newer cards. There are tons of the older sets that now Pokemon being 25 years old, Pokemon's been producing sets, several sets, every single year for the past 25 years. So I've done vintage and older type of set Pokemon card openings. And then, of course, as you mentioned, Pokemon is still, to this day, producing multiple sets every single year. And they're not stopping anytime soon. There's a reason why Pokemon is the highest grossing media franchise in the entire world. They are still producing the card game, and it's still quality as ever, and more people than ever are getting into the Pokemon card game. So even if Pokemon did decide to stop, like, tomorrow, not producing any more cards, you know, there would be another, like, 10 to 20 year leeway of still content that I can still produce you know, from all of the older sets that have come out. So let's talk money a little bit. Obviously, you don't need to get into specifics, but can you tell us about your mix of revenue, ads, brand deals, whatever else, if you do any merch, and any advice around sustaining your channel or anyone's channel from a revenue standpoint? Yeah, so um, I would say the ad revenue from YouTube is definitely one of the biggest things for myself. Uh, but that being said, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, another cliche saying. That's where you have the different type of brand deals that you can do. And I've done several brand deals before. I'm pretty picky myself just because I like to actually be like using or for the type of product that I would do a brand deal for and know that my audience, who's extremely loyal, uh, introduce them to it and that they would use it as well. And so uh, having brand deals, extremely important. Uh, as I'm wearing right now, I do have my own merch right here, the Leonhardt logo on it. And so I do have that as well too. And then of course, there's several other things that YouTube offers as well, like members and other types of ways that you can you know, interact with Super Chat and everything that you can do with your community too. So all of that combined uh, is just the ultimate recipe for just success. And that's how I've been able to sustain it for uh, I think it's been almost seven years now. Related to revenue, let's talk about being a lone individual creator versus making videos with a team. I mean, we talked about you in your, I assume you're in your home, you know, you can, you're very self-contained, self-sustainable. Do you operate with any sort of team now? It's kind of the thing. I, I am a one man team other than finally the past six months, I got an editor and that was more so in myself for trust issues of issues of passing my baby, which is my videos, my content creation to somebody else to, you know, wonder if they can produce the work because I was editing all my videos and I still make all my titles, thumbnails, um, produce my videos, ideas. Uh, you know, I handle all my marketing, brand deals, merch, everything is just myself. But it was finally taking that leap, that trust in putting my videos and editing them into somebody else. And so thankfully, I now have an editor but other than that, it is just myself. And as you mentioned, I just have my lone studio here and I'm able to do everything I can from my studio, which makes it very convenient, um, easy, and probably ultimately how I'm able to have done this for so long is that kind of convenience that I've kind of made. Do you feel like the editor is the first logical hire that a creator should bring on? and? And what's your advice on finding them and, and like sort of training them? It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I absolutely agree that the editor is usually the first step because uh, Mr. Beast or Jimmy I, had the exact type of thing where he was uh, a little worried of getting an editor for himself, you know, trust issues, it, just like myself. And, and then he finally got that editor. And then it's been like now has a full on workhorse team and everything. Now it's kind of like the initial floodgates open when you do get that first thing. And usually I've noticed, uh, not just for myself, that it is getting an editor. And so finding an editor is very crucial. Um, you know, for myself, I literally just made a video and asking, you know, can you edit? And I had a bunch of people contacting me, um, lots of amazing, talented people out there, but you got to find the person that just kind of is, you know, knows your personality, somebody that knows your content and has been watching you for a while. Like, I really can't stress that enough because there's plenty of amazingly talented people out there, but it's those people that just have that connection in with you uh, that have been watching your content. And this person that I did hire had been watching my content and basically, you know, we had a trial period, wasn't amazing, wasn't perfect, but eventually it gets to it where, you know, you're just synced up. It takes time, right? I, I actually mm -hmm. led a video production team here at YouTube and I was the same way as a creator. 
perfectionist. No, I can't bring on an editor. No way, they, they don't get, but it just takes a little time and, and I always encourage creators to take that leap because there's so many talented people out there. You're not the only talented person out there and they can learn your style. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Uh, you know, I try to be a perfectionist, has it advantages, disadvantages, but once you make that leap, I can't stress enough how uh, for time management purposes and just improving your own content, you'll be surprised. You think you know it all and you have it all and you're, you know, worried about giving out, passing it on to somebody else. But, you know, it's a little learning curve, but then you just see the results keep on compounding into a good way. Let's talk about analytics specifically. Analytics are amazing. Some people stress themselves out by looking at them. What's your your thought on analytics? How often do you use them? What do you focus on? Uh, analytics wise, I am always taking advantage of what YouTube has to offer, uh, especially with all the changes in a positive way of knowing audience retention fallout, like when they fall off, when they stay on for a while, consistency. And so myself in particular, whenever I post a new video, whether it may be a little too uh, obsessive, I'm like 15 minutes in, I'm looking at how a video does compare to the previous one and the other ones. 30 minutes in, I'm looking at how well it does, likes, views, um, you know, as much as I can get from analytics, I'm looking in different increments for basically every single video and uh, try to improve every single time from those analytics. And then of course, when you get more uh, click-through rate, when you find that out in the next several hours after a video post, I'm an audience uh, average view duration, I'm looking at that as well once those analytics are available to me as soon as they are. Is it a positive experience look at that? or Because a lot of a lot of creators, including myself, would kind of freak out if, if the, the numbers are dipping in a particular video. I, I will say that it is kind of discouraging when you see a video to get like 10 out of 10 on the uh, ranking when it first comes out. But I will also stress like, uh, and what I try to tell myself is be patient. Um, just because a video may perform a certain way at the beginning on this certain day, time, doesn't a topic, doesn't mean that it won't perform or, you know, increase in performance later on. And so I will say, yes, it does get a little anxious and nerve wracking when I see a video underperforming. But at the same time, I, I really do try to distance myself from, you know, being like, this is the end all if a video is not doing well, you know, type of thing. It, but, but it goes likewise, if a video is still doing well. It's I try to understand what can I improve on this video and why is this video doing well compared to other ones? You got the whole Creator Insider audience, lots of creators, lots of small creators, medium size, even large creators. If you had one piece of advice to um, give them about their own growth or their own well-being, what would it be? It would be to just be excited about what you do and that will come off to whoever's watching your video and to be very very patient um, i know that was maybe two things but please just you know hang in there be confident in what you do and your abilities just start recording doesn't have to be perfect at the beginning but you can always improve and you will improve and the audience and community will you know we'll see that and just you know rome, rome wasn't built in a day my channel wasn't built in a day it did take several years but other people's channels, it took much faster. So that's what's so exciting about it in whatever niche that you do get into, be passionate about it, be excited about it, and I promise you results will come. That's awesome. Your story is, is so inspiring. Thanks uh, so much for being with us, Lee. Absolutely, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.